six years ago now. It was a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's ancient history. You've seen tremendous success from there. But I, I wanted to pull up another another quote from you um, where you were talking recently with uh, with uh, Michael Malice. Yeah. And uh, I thought this was like, unless you've truly been in this situation, you don't really understand. And I thought that you put this way better than I could possibly put it. Because I think you are, you're like a wordsmith. I just kind of ramble, right? Thank you. you. I very... appreciate that. It's like one of the only things I'm good at. We always make fun of like, I don't know anything that's useful. I can just, I just know video games and I can write well. And that's basically it. So I appreciate that. Thank you're you. very articulate in how you speak. And I, I just kind of mumble out a bunch of words, but you said this very well. And I, 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 I just wanted to say this was phenomenal. And I may be the only one who gets anything out of this, but I appreciate this. When I saw a therapist after it all happened. Okay, good. One of the things I said was... It, you kind of can't help but take it really personally that no one gives a shit. Like no one out there who knew you, worked with you, even lived with you, shared a cubicle with you, traveled with you is being like, whoa, 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 racist? Like what? what did, so that kind of, that silence allows things to become quote unquote real. And I think that's one of the things that bothers me most, most about talking about cancellation is everyone's always like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's, this isn't really happening. And I'm like, what? it matters to the person who it happened to. Right. I appreciate that. And, and like I said, I think for, for me, I've never been able to articulate it that way. Right. And that, yeah, I, you know, me personally, I, I took a lot of the things that, that have been said about me personally. Right. And, you know, you've got it. You got it tremendously bad. You know, you, you got booted. I was, I've never been booted from conventions. I've just never even been invited to conventions. Right. Yeah. Oh, uh, I don't get invited to shit, but yeah, I, you know, so. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, you've, you've talked about how you've reached out to, to the kind of funny folks, you know, just out of the idea of you needed to get it off your chest. Uh, what was the response there? Well, yeah. I mean, so I, really the only, I, I've actually talked to Nick and Kevin at various times. So, um, when I sold my shares to kind of funny, they, they, they paid me four times. They owed me four big bursts of money and it was like right away. And then at the end of that year, the end of the next year and the end of the year after that. And I basically was making like my salary plus whatever, 50% for those years or something mm -hmm. to buy out. And it was awesome. I mean, I was really grateful for that, but that required me to keep in touch with Nick to like, you know, um, cause Nick is like kind of the administrator of the business. Um, so we would keep in touch every once in a while. And then I would text him once in a while or they would reach, he would reach out to me once in a while. If someone thought of something, I talked to Kevin behind the scenes every once in a while, but Greg is the one that, you know, Greg and I were, were very, very close. And in, in hindsight, it's kind of a shame that we, and I don't mean this as any, in any disrespect to the others who are, you know, but it, we really should have just done it by ourselves. And you mean, you mean you leaving kind of funny with Greg, right? And no, no, me leaving IGN oh, to okay. make kind of funny with, Sorry, I should be clear with with sure. Greg. Like, and when other people became involved in it, it quickly lost what I thought it was going to be. So that it, like, what Last Stand is now is kind of what I would have had assumed that we would have done with kind of funny. And so, um, but I respect that the, the course that they've taken, and I have tried to keep in touch with Greg over the years. Like when his dog died, who I you know I lived with Greg for almost a decade, so I I basically lived with his dog. Mm -hmm. um but he didn't get back to me on that and i emailed him a, like uh, i saw podcast beyond which is our old show at ign just did i think their 800th or 700th episode or something like that and I, e I emailed him a joke being like how does this show still shambling on it's like incredible we left it like 315 or something but he didn't answer that and it's it's pretty clear that he doesn't want anything to do with me but i was encouraged and i'm not going to like continue to try but i was encouraged by my actually a therapist that i was seeing it's like you got to you got to like let go of the anger and try to just be normal and at least, you know, put out there that you want to bury the hatchet and all that. And you can't really do anything if a person wants to reciprocate or not. And I understand his position, I think, because it wasn't intentional, but I really hurt kind of funny when I left. And I know, I know that in hindsight that I did. And I don't, I don't know that they've, they seem to have kind of just stayed flat. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel bad about that. That was not my intention. My intention was to leave so that they can do what they wanted because it was clear that what I wanted to do and what they wanted to do were different. Well, maybe but, they uh, have and it just hasn't worked. Yeah, I think, 
I don't know how it all works, to be honest, from the outside. Um, like our, my Patreon is substantially bigger than Kind of Funny has ever done on Patreon. Right. And we have far lower overhead than them. And we don't have a space. We don't have all these things. So I don't really know quite how it works. I think that's part of what really bothered me about working there, though, was the constant endemic advertising which we don't do on last name we refuse all money from games companies um and as people know that listen to sacred symbols we don't do pr contact at all we don't get games early we don't do anything like that we don't do go to events we don't let people pay us for any of that stuff we only do non-endemic advertising um and then the constant like hosting and doing all these kinds of things to bring money and, and revenue in um it seems like the i don't really understand the economics of it but i, I don't you know i don't know the, co the, co the company's ins and outs anymore it just doesn't seem the the aesthetic doesn't seem to match the numbers and i don't think the aesthetic is necessary that's right. that was kind of the biggest thing i loved working out of my spare bedroom in san francisco i i wish we always just stayed there mm -hmm. um well so you know, yeah so you you said something and, and i don't want to uh, i don't want to floss by this because i don't i don't want to uh misinterpret your words you said you you felt like it should have been just you and greg to do it by yourself and then when other people got got involved when you say other people, are you speaking of Nick and Tim? Yeah, although I don't want to. It sounds like I'm insulting them, and I'm really not. I right. I actually think that Nick, in particular, played a very important role early on as our as like our filmer and our producer. Um, and I appreciate all of that. But yeah, it felt like Greg and I, I think, started to kind of like unravel during this era a little bit, and I think it's because. Um, of the involvement of a lot of other people and personalities and trying to do different shows and trying to direct things without really trusting our instincts about what worked and what didn't. And the reality is that people were there to see Greg and I mm -hmm. um, in the beginning. And that obviously changed over time. But I, I wonder, I think back sometimes, um, you know, what would, what it would have been like if we did things differently. Cause I do lament the fact that like, it makes me sad. It makes me sad. So I do a show sacred symbols which is a PlayStation podcast. It's the third major PlayStation podcast ever. And the tether that connects all those shows is me. But it's interesting that like Greg and I really could have kept doing that maybe even at a higher level together, but it just became too complicated. It became too complex. And mm -hmm. um, that's why I just, you wonder if like you could have just kept it together in a smaller way. Um, what would have happened as opposed to really believing the hype and believing the energy and then trying to really, outpace our growth and really listen to things that aren't true and spend money that we don't need to spend and right. ally ourselves with company we don't need to be allied with and um and all the rest and so yeah I, I quickly it quickly lost its luster for me because i just felt like we were turning into ign and i was like well why did i i could have stayed at ign and made one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and just been totally fine i mean they got a great know. set yeah, yeah. Much. <laughs> that, i mean i'm not i'm not insulting like their aesthetic is awesome i just You're don't right. understand what Sacred Symbols does much more traffic than their PlayStation podcast, and we film it out of our, our out of our bedrooms. We don't need well, it's that authentic, kind of thing, so. right? That's the thing is it's, it goes back to authenticity, right? People care about authenticity online. They care about you. They care about your thoughts on it. They don't care about the backlight and the amazing set. The amazing set is nice for sponsors and advertisers. Look at how professional. Look at how shiny this is. But at the end of the day, people see you, and they care about you. And they care about your thoughts on what's happening on the PlayStation, which is which makes it which is why traffic, and that's why you're the common thread. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, it's it's. I'm honored by that. I mean, the one thing that I'll say is that like I'm always willing to bury the hatchet with Greg because I just think life is too short, and you got to look at the perspective of other people, and you got to remember where you've been, and you got to remember who's helped you and who's been there. And certainly, I was there for him, and he was there for me. And so hopefully one day we can at least bury the hatchet, shake hands, even if just digitally or whatever, and just and move on. But that's I've I've long considered that ball no longer in my court. Right. And so because at some point it come it comes off as almost desperate, right? And I'm not I'm not desperate. I'm just trying to be kind um to well, to various people that I care about. And uh, but at some point you gotta you gotta accept reality and the other person has to reciprocate. It's like um Nikki described it as a divorce in one of his interviews. And I was like, yeah, I, I totally, because we were like so close and just, we lived together, we worked together, we traveled together. We were, Greg and I were together all the time. And, and we, tr I can't speak for him, but I truly never got tired of him. Mm -hmm. Like, um, we were, well, we were, we had a special friendship like that. So it's a shame to see it go, but business really does complicate things. And other people really do complicate things and change the way things are looked at. And I also have to take responsibility for my own actions too, in terms of, I was in a pretty dark place 
you know, in that, in my, in my life for years, really. And Greg did try to help me and tried to encourage me to go see people and do all those kinds of things. But I hadn't yet been medicated when I was like kind of funny. I, I was later, you know, I was, um, I was uh, diagnosed as, you know, really depressed and, um, and have a really bad anxiety and all of that, but that happened afterwards. So some, so you have to also take responsibility or I have to take responsibility for my own demeanor during that time, which was very defeated and not energized about the content as well. So there's a lot to go into it. But like you said, it was a long time ago. It's funny because it almost is like fleeting my imagination. Right. Ultimately, I'm going to have to go back to shows like this in 20 years to remember what the hell anything, what, what, what anyone said or what happened at all. Well, let me ask you this. When you when you go back and let's say I, I do research for all interviews that we do and, and I go back and I watch previous interviews because I don't want to like have overlapping conversations, although there will be some. Right. What are your thoughts when you go back and I'm, I, you were in the room when this happened uh, and this was the stream that they had. When you hear a statement like this, do you feel that, uh, how do you feel about this? Let me just play this. Today, in the way he handled the situation. I've never been more proud of him today. In the way he handled the situation, the way we talked about it, how, how everything went today. There were so many ways where I was like, this could go fucking a million different ways that would be horrible for everyone involved. And this is the best case scenario. And in literally, I don't know, I don't have his timeline for anything. In, I'll say two years, even, we're all going to look back and be like, this was the best. Because it is going to be that, hey, you're making awesome shit. We're making awesome shit. We all love each other. You still get to come out. We cross over and do, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Do you feel like that's bullshit? going back and watching that now yes but i but i i um i think that when you're in the moment i remember those days that maybe not that specific day but like so at the office that we worked at when we left our apartment we had a you like walked up these stairs and went into the space you might have been there i don't i don't know and um the we had like this rooftop and Greg and I just sat on the roof. San Francisco is literally behind us and, you know, beautiful scenery. And we were just talking and basically breaking up. And, and I remember that um, very, very vividly. And that might be re really right after this when, so you can't really, it is bullshit, but it's, I don't know that that was the intention. I think that things heavily change. Like if you ask Greg in March of 2017, would you go six years without ever talking to Colin? Right. Uh, basically, I, I think he would say, no, that sounds insane. And he would mean it. But I think the reality, the different things changed. I also think that over time, as people have asked me about it and as I've opened up more about it, I think um, people have started to kind of go back and look at content and see the divisions before they even started to to be there and read into things and all of that. I just, I try not to read too much in that. People bring that conversation up all the time about they were going to invite sure. him back and have him on. And um, I think someone asked me recently, like, what are they going to do for their 10th anniversary? You know, um, are they going to acknowledge you at all? Because even someone showed me a video where they they had some footage of me in one of the videos, but there, it was always bad footage. Like it was a footage of me with like a mic in front of my face, or like where you could mm -hmm. never see my face. And I'm like, it's so, it's so Eddie, strange. It's bullshit. just not my it's not my company anymore. But um, yeah, it's bullshit. I I was, I will say that the way they treated me and alienated me did a long, went a long way to letting everyone else alienate me. Right. When when Greg was willing to alienate me and not come to my defense not that it's his job to come to my defense that was basically the end for me in terms of being in mainstream gaming culture and uh yeah so that's just the way it went